Hello, today we're going to be looking at the Formant Analog Synthesizer. Formant Analog Synthesizer. So a little bit over a year ago now, I did a video on the Formant DIY Analog Synthesizer as part of the DIY Synthesizer series, to which I've covered a fair few already and there is a link to a playlist below. Well, the Formant DIY project came out in Elector magazine starting in May 1977, and it gave you all of the information on how to build your very own DIY Analog Synthesizer. There is a link in the description of a PDF file of the full part one series of the Elector Formant. If you haven't watched the first video that I've done on the Elector Formant, maybe check that out first because it will give you more of an insight into the history and the project itself. But in this video, we're going to build upon what we found out in the last one by making a bigger and better Formant. A couple of weeks after I put that video up, I got contacted by Steve Clark, who had a spare box full of loose Formant modules of completely unknown condition, which I ended up purchasing from Steve. They got shipped over from Germany and I had a good old rummage around. There was a fair few modules in this box, including a few filters, oscillators, various envelope generators and voltage controlled amplifiers, as well as numerous unbuilt PCBs and panels. Regrettably, for the last year, this box has been sitting on a shelf and I really hate having unfinished projects sitting around. It makes me feel all weird inside. So in this video, we're going to make a change to that. The Electro Foreman that I covered in the last video, I've got to be honest, was a bit of a basket case of a synthesizer. That's the thing about buying a DIY synthesizer. The quality always varies from project to project. That's because one of them could have been built by somebody who knows what they're doing, and the other one could have been built by somebody that was very well-meaning. However, it turned into a bit of a rat's nest. You know, the quality of DIY synthesizers is not guaranteed. And that synth has somewhat tarnished my opinion of the formant. And I want to change that by getting a more realistic experience of a formant by making a better one, basically. The other formant is not completely set up to how it is described in the magazines. The thing is, the formant isn't actually a modular synthesizer. No, no, no. It's a semi-modular synthesizer. Yes, it's supposed to be intended to be set up like a Korg MS-10 or Korg MS-20. The idea is that there is a default setup for the synthesizer. You have no patches in all of those jack holes and you play the synthesizer, twiddle the knobs, it's going to make some noise. That's because there is a default way the synthesizer is routed. So the oscillators get mixed together and then they go into the filters and then that goes into the voltage controlled amplifier and so on. But once you start putting jacks into the different sockets, you're able to kind of reroute things and change the synthesizer from the default settings. This varies from other combi synthesizers of the time, for instance the Mini Moog. It hasn't got different routing possibilities except for what is available on the knobs and switches. The old formant, however, was on the other side of the spectrum. It was set up in a completely modular way. That means around the back the only things that were actually connected together in the synthesizer modules was the power. And this is a very similar setup to most Eurorack synthesizers as well as DIY synthesizers like the Digisound 80 as well as my Cosmo synthesizer. These are fully modular synthesizers, that means none of the modules are talking to each other until you start putting cables here, there and everywhere. This made the Foreman that I have not a great synthesizer because it wasn't originally intended as a fully modular synthesizer. So not all of the parameters are actually available on jack sockets and it somewhat limits the possibilities that were originally intended for the synthesizer. I spoke about it in the previous video like it wasn't a problem, but since I've come to use the synthesizer more, I've realized it's quite a downfall for the machine. The problem is making it pre-patched around the back makes the whole build quite a bit more complicated and we're going to find out why and how in this video. There's also some extra videos, samples and songs made with this Formant synthesizer available on my Patreon which is down below which helps support these silly projects right here. Anyway enough chatting, let's talk about the build. I started by bashing a case together, I did this in a similar way I've built other synthesizer cases. That's with some cut to size plywood panels for the top and the sides. I merely glued and screwed them together then used another bit of timber in the middle to separate the two module shelves and a few even thinner bits of wood to screw the modules into. Oh yeah, and this, this is it. Oh lovely trouble. So this case is big enough to fit 12 of the big modules on the bottom and 12 of the little modules on the top. I have more formant than this can fit. However, the plan is, is to get this working and then figure out uh, making another case on top uh, at a later date. Now we have the case, we need to figure out how to put the power connector chonky bits around the back. So we've got this VCO, we're going to start with the voltage controlled oscillator. I think we're going to have one over here first. We're going to screw that in and we're going to use this to measure out everything around 
around the back. I don't know how obvious this is, but from the back, uh, this connector is at exactly the same height in the case as that connector over there. And it is exactly the same depth going back. So with this in mind, we need to make a kind of metal connector chassis that goes all the way over here that we can connect all of the connectors together. So then they all have their designated spots and then we wire all of the designated wires to the back of this thingamagoop and it should be done. Bish bosh bash. How we do that is a bit of a mystery as of right now. I've got these aluminium extrudes and we're going to use this, I think. Uh, we're going to cut it to size so it fits inside and then we're going to bolt these to some wood or something and then we can bolt this to that and it should be all right. Yeah, I think this is going to work. Right, so that's going to sit right, right up here. Pop that right there precision engineering you see that i've drawn where the metal seems to sit so what we're going to do is get a bit of wood that kind of sits here sawineering right here nearly i just got sand off the top and it's all right oh oh yeah bit of the old gorilla glue use the clamp and everything beautiful oh yeah beautiful right so now put those bits of wood on the back as well as ones on for the top rows as well because there's a top row and they've got the same power connectors so we're just going to let the glue dry i'm going to give this a bit of a paint a bit of a wood stain and we're going to get we're going to get going with this Now the case has been sufficiently 70sified, we can start building the synthesizer into it. We're going to start by putting the metal bars in, we're going to screw these onto these metal plates so they ain't going to go nowhere, and then after that we can start putting in the uh, connectors. Uh, I was doing this by eye, so this was the first one. I was going to add some supports to this, but it's actually quite sturdy, so it doesn't need it. Um, then I took out some extra modules from the older rat nest foreman, because we're going to add to it, and you'll notice that they're, they're, they're shorter! How annoying is that? Uh, so I didn't think about this, but if you look closely, you'll see that these uh, mounts are actually handmade. They've been cut up. So luckily, in this box that Stephen had, there was some of the official ones uh, sitting in the bottom. So I managed to uh, put some of these on these first modules, which made them the same length as the rest of them. So they would actually line up with the back connectors. And then I drilled some holes, put some more connectors in for each of them. And bit by bit, one by one, the oscillators were being put in place and they fitted nicely to the connectors. So this is the third oscillator after fiddling with it a bit. This next one is a filter. It's a 24 dB filter. You can see it's the same length, but it's a different size. And the rest of it goes on the top as well. So these all go in quite straightforward. You just pop them in, uh, kind of figure out where the connectors go, drill the holes, pop the connectors in, and hope for the best, basically. And uh, yeah, bit by bit, uh, it started to come together. I didn't have enough of those official mounts, so some of them had to be put in with spacers and standoffs because they were all different lengths. It was quite a hodgepodge, but it came out all right in the end. Uh, this is a random module. I'm not even sure what it is. It's on stripboard, but I thought it was too cool to not put in anyway. And then next to that, a ring modulator, which is also a short circuit board that is not going to have a connector connected to it. This is for the power and also the keyboard connector. We'll look at that in a little bit. This is going to go and connect in the back so we can connect the keyboard into it. And then there's this very small stripboard for the power for all of the things that don't actually have their own mounts and connectors on those metal rails. Now we've got a wire in the power to the back of the connectors. This isn't as straightforward as you might think because every single module uh, the power is on a different pin uh, I, I know it's a bit odd but whatever so we had to figure out where the power goes the plus 15 volts the minus 15 volts the ground and then the oscillators also have a 5 volt line as well now all that's plumbed in we can see if all of these modules actually work <laughs> So this oscillator worked, but the one next to it didn't, and I couldn't figure out why until I found out that there was actual power connectors uh, at various points on the actual pin connectors, which didn't make sense. But after I fixed that, then it started working. But this potentiometer was broke, so I had to swap it out. And then finally, we have life. <laughs> Hey, success! Bit by bit! It was at this point a package arrived from JVR Foreman. Uh, I didn't realize until doing some research recently that JVR actually makes brand new Foreman modules. I bought this off him. He only sells assembled modules, no PCB kits, but he offers reproductions of most of the Foreman modules with a more modern PCB around the back. I went for a sequencer to add some more depth to this synthesizer. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now we've got to fill the rest of the synth case. So we're going to take the other modules out of the older one because we don't need that case anymore because it's a right hodgepodge. Uh, these all still needed modifying to actually fit it with the normal uh, form and sizes. And some of the wires actually needed extending because it was extended longer than the original designed form and that that was bodged to. There's some dates in there. 1981 this was built and then refurbished in 1991. There's a picture of the spacer on this one. They were all different spacers because all of them were like hodgepodge together. This is the envelope generators for the other side of the synthesizer because we're going to make a stereo synth. This com is the output. It's got a equalizer, bass metal treble and some volume and also some lights to show you that all of the power is working as it should. Uh, we're going to put this in at the end because that's the output for the synthesizer. Now we're going to make an aesthetic effort by uh, changing the knobs to all of the matching knobs. I didn't have enough so I got some spray paint and sprayed these white knobs uh, a kind of funky grey to make it fit. Uh, the best one I found was Ford Dove Grey to make it look the same colour as your granddad's Ford Cortina. <laughs> anyway, they match pretty well as you can see. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I was so pleased with how the spraying the knobs turned out, I decided to spray the knobs of the sequencer as well, because as you saw, they were not matching at all. They were fancy and black ones. Let's make them into these weird gray things. Anyway, uh, we're going to start fixing the keyboard. Well, at least looking and seeing what's wrong with it. I mean, I haven't even tested this yet, so we'll just scope out what's going on. Underneath, you'll see that it is controlled by these springs, and a lot of them kind of were not fitting very well, and they were all kind of like caught on different bits. But this is premonition, because you'll see it's going to bite us in the arse later on. Uh, yeah, I changed the connector, which is not a MIDI connector. It is actually just the connections for the voltage from the keyboard to the synth. After I tested the connections were right, it was time to add this little circuit board into the module box itself. It's a buffer for the keyboard, so it, uh, it goes on the other side of the wire and kind of standardizes the voltage from the keyboard. Apparently, it can run without this, but this is a good measure to avoid abnormalities. Ooh, very fancy. After that, we're going to test it. You can see the lights flashing now for the keyboard gates and then yeah it's buffering that and then I tuned it to be volt per octave this synthesizes volt per octave so you hit a C and you hit a higher C and you try and get it as close to a volt difference between each of the C's as you possibly can as you can see that's pretty much a volt in each octave after that I was pretty confident that the keyboard was gonna work we were gonna have to start wiring all of the wires into the back of the synthesizer this yellow wire goes from the gate output of that buffer circuit board that is buffering the keyboard Board, and that wires into the inputs of the envelope generators. Then this pink wire is the control voltage out of the keyboard and that wires into the back of the oscillators to give the tune. As you can hear right now, it's working. Or not for long. Uh. Uh -oh. Yeah, you know that premonition earlier about those springs? Well, it turns out they are very easy to kind of flick onto each other and get stuck. But now it's starting to work. The voltage of the keyboard also goes into the filter. You see that ECV KOV switch? If you flick that to keyboard output voltage, you can actually get it to control the filter with the keyboard as well. Make it sound like robots. Now the keyboard's working and all the voltages are internally wired to the modules from the back, we can look at this image from the magazine which shows you where all of the connectors around the back are supposed to go. The next thing we're going to wire in is the output of the signal, the audio out of the oscillators into the input of the filter. So these purple wires that I'm putting in are wired to the pins of the output from the back of the oscillators and then they're wiring into the inputs on the VCF. So you can see there the purple ones right there. Thank you. 
that was the first time we heard all of the oscillators going into the filter because there's a mixer around the back, so that's why we can hear them all. A lot of the twisty knobs were wired in backwards. It's a DIY synth. What do you expect? So I wired them around the right way after that. Uh, this oscillator also didn't work because it's a switched jack. When uh, there's no jack wired in, then it goes into internal routing mode, but it, it wasn't working. But now it works, as you can hear. So have a listen. There's two and three, baby. Now for the rest of the internal wiring, the output of the ADSR into the voltage input of the VCF, and the voltage output of the ADSR into the voltage input of the VCA, but the signal output of the VCF needs to go into the audio input of the VCA, but then the audio output of the VCA needs to go into the RFM. <gasps> It says it all in the magazine. If you want to read it more, then the link is below to what I'm reading here. It's just a layout. But it gets a bit complicated because some of the PCBs have labels and then the unofficial PCBs, well, they have no labels at all, which doesn't help when the pins are all over the place, it seems, and there's no standardization between modules. But anyway, I got there in the end. So I did all this wiring that I just described and I'm, I'm running out of breath already. This is a lot of talking, I've got to be honest. But uh, yeah, and after this, we nearly have a fully fledged synth voice. So let's, let's have a listen. Shall we? Oscillators all needed a little bit of calibrating, but surprisingly not much at all. They were already out of the box, pretty in tune. may think we're done, but you're completely wrong. We've got to finish the rest of the synthesizer. So we're going to put some more modules in this side. I went for exactly the same style of synth voice over here. So we've got two of them that are going to make different sounds at the same time. You'll find out how magical that sounds later in the video. But as you can see, uh, yeah, this one, uh, there was a few problems. I needed to swap a few things like this switch, which was broken. And then I popped it in. And then after wiring all of the wires again to the back, but on this side, it's exactly the same setup as before, uh, we can take Test these. I wasn't as lucky with this side. It took a fair bit of trying to get these to somewhat work, especially this voltage controlled filter, which just wasn't working for no reason. I swapped a bunch of capacitors and chips and stuff, reading the schematic, which made it helpful, but it was only until I compared it to the working one from the other side of the synthesizer, I noticed that this dual transistor package was wired in upside down, and that'll explain it. There's another thing to be said about repairing DIY synthesizers. Even though you get a plethora of documentation and descriptions on how the circuits work and things like that. Unless you've spoken to the builder of the kit, you can never assume that it actually worked in the first place. And an example of that is this filter module. It would have never worked because the transistors were upside down. There were signs of the builder trying to figure out why it didn't work because there was a few different resistor values here and there, which I ended up having to put back to normal because the problem wasn't actually fixed. Keep that in mind because you might have to be looking a little bit closer than you were expecting to. Give it a snip. Oh, come on. What's with all the blunt pliers? Yeah, we're getting really close to the end now. It was at this time where I decided to do a bit of wax lacing to clean it all up a bit. So we've got this wiggly, wiggly, wiggly around the back. Twist that and just poke this through that. Pull the whole thing through. Slowly kind of find where you want it to be. It takes quite a bit of practice to get it to the right length. And then tug it that way. Uh, and then you just do the same again. So I'm going to do it like I did actually. That's a different... That's an easier way of doing it. So twist, pop it in the hole, pop it in the hoop, and then then we got that. And then um, find where you want it to be, roughly. And then pull it, give it a good tug. I like wax lacing. It looks a lot neater, in my opinion, than cable ties. That's why I went for that. Anyway, after that, it was nearly done. We added this mixer to the output module because there's two synthesizers now that needed mixing together, and it's done. <laughs>
<laughs> I forgot to mention I added two output jacks on the side. <laughs> So as far as this video is concerned, it is done. There are still a few little jobs here and there to do. Uh, one of the LFOs here doesn't work, the one in the middle, it's not lighting up. This oscillator's got something weird going on and I haven't quite got to the bottom of it yet. And this oscillator isn't even assembled. But apart from that, it should all be working. So let's get it plugged in and see what it can do. Okay, I'm an absolute blithering idiot. I don't know how I did this. I lent it over and on the corner of the keyboard, I managed to snap off the uh, the switches of this brand new sequencer blooming thing. I'm gonna have to contact them and see if I can get a link to the replacements or buy some replacements. That is so annoying. Luckily, they're not massively important right now, but Ah, what a pain in the bottom. Anyway, so it's set up like a dual uh, synthesizer. This means that there are two separate synthesizers running in parallel. This is the same as a synthesizer like the CS15, Yamaha CS15, where there's two separate synthesizers. They've got an oscillator, a filter, envelope generators and VCAs, two of them. So they run in parallel, so you get two separate synth sounds at the same time, albeit being controlled by the same note because it's still monophonic. Right now they're both being wired via that mixer that we added around the back of the comm, so they're going in and coming out in a mono form. In a second we're going to do a stereo thing. Let's listen to only this synthesizer first and it already sounds like a 1980s electro pop banger. <laughs> Oh baby, baby! Turn on the RFM, the resonant frequency m -m -m monkey. Sort of like a resonant EQ. Oh my god, this goddamn keyboard, it's already stuck. I've got a spring stuck. Oh, what a pain in the derriere. Right, one sec, I've got to do this. That's why these springs get a bit too excited with themselves and they end up just popping back up here. There's loads of them that have done it. What an annoying design. Oh yeah, I forgot we can adjust the bass. And the mid. Oh. That's the volume. And the treble. Oh, nice. Nice. There's a bit of a uh, crackling. Turn this one down and turn up this synthesizer voice. Which right now, I must add, is only a single oscillator because this one's decided to play up. There's something seriously up with that one and this one's not even built. So we've got a single oscillator one here. So double, triple and a single. But it's, it's, it's enough to get going. So we'll get a nice... We'll get a slower thing going. Oh no. And then turn this one back up. Oh no! Oh god damn it, this friggin' keyboard! No, you're joking. Oh that is... This gosh darn keyboard's gonna be... Oh my gosh. It's got a fair bit of chonk to it. Now, okay, let's... Uh, I've left it long enough. Let's get some patch cables on the go. Okay, dokie. So, we're going to start patching. <laughs> we'll get a single patch cable going here and doing all the stuff. A control voltage input, modulation input, uh, from this oscillator right here. Right, let's get the uh, LFO coming out of here into the clock input of the uh, sequencer. Get that coming out of the uh, voltage output into the voltage input of this oscillator.
So now via these cables over here, both of these are coming out of separate outputs. Uh, right now, left and right, slightly panned. So we got the... Got the left and right. Oh yeah. You're gonna have to modify it to actually get it to um, talk to the keyboard and the gate at the same time. That's a bit annoying. It's a bit of an oversight with this uh, machine is there's no external gate input in the design initially. So uh, it's just keyboard right now and the keyboard's absolutely rubbish. really stands out with this one with its setup right now is it's actually pretty damn chonky sounding I don't know whether that's the correct definition but in the next one when we finally have six oscillators and the modified external gate and keyboard inputs and extra things I don't know when that'll happen but I really think this synthesizer might be a force to be reckoned with and if you've noticed there's only two patch cables in it right now in fact like I've been perfectly happy just fiddling around with it with its internal patching it's really nice <laughs> Blooming awesome actually, that sounds really cool. It's like two synthesizers in one, but it's got a real fat sound to it. Get a little bit of um, LFO into this filter. And then a little bit of LFO from the other LFO into this filter. I wasn't expecting to really like it. I mean, when I've got over the fact that the keyboard's a bit of a mishmash, this is really cool. I haven't even used the external sequencers and stuff. Well, we've used the sequencer a little bit, but it just sounds really good. Get some more LFOs on the go. All right, let's add this to the CV. <laughs> See, the fact is, this actually has six LFOs in it, albeit one of them isn't working right now, but it really means you could just plug in random LFOs into random malarkey. Oh, the wobbles, the wiggles, the wobblies. Random voltage out of the noise. Plug that into external CV. We'll get the external CV plugged into it. That means it's not gonna. <laughs> sequencer as well. And we're going to sequence, it's all going to be going on now. Flick it over from the keyboard control, I think. There we go. Turn this one 
back up. It's going crazy now. Um. <laughs> There's a lot to focus on. That's pretty mad. I really need to get more into this. I want to fix this. I want to fix these two oscillators. I'll do this in a subsequent video and we'll get more out of it then. And then hopefully, and maybe in that same video, there'll be another case which will have another, I've still got another four oscillators, a bunch of ADSRs and VCAs. So there's enough to get a whole other synth voice. So that'll be three synth voices uh, all controlled by the same notes and stuff. So you get the same kind of texturization from the foreman. It's pretty cool. It's really interesting to build it as it was intended because it makes you use it completely differently. You uh, save all of the patch cables, not just for getting the bog standard synth routing. You end up using it all for modulation like I've done right here. There's a lot to focus on, isn't there? <laughs> How cool is that? Oops. For this video, because it's getting quite long, this is the end of the road, but there's going to be another part after this. Hopefully it won't take as long as the last time. I've included a direct recording of all the sounds and riffs and stuff. You can chop them up and use them uh, as you will and like, and they're over on Patreon. So if you want to use them for things and stuff and support making these machines and these videos, then go and check it out over there. There's a bunch of other videos on that. I did a bunch of videos whilst this was going up, including how to wax lace and stuff like that. So that's over on Patreon. Supports all of this stuff and the museum that this is going to go into, because by all means, come and play on this. It will be able to be played in. Uh, this museum's not obsolete. The link is below uh, with a load of other DIY synthesizers and things like that. There might be a weekend. I don't know which one it will be gone again because I'm going to try and build it and improve it and fix it and stuff. But for now, if you want to play on it, come over to this museum's not obsolete. Anyway, I hope you learned something today. I'm Luke Mum No Computer. This is the Formant Synthesizer. If you like what you see, don't forget to subscribe and don't be scared to try. Don't be scared to try. Maybe don't sit here and cry for a soldier for a week. Bye.